Okay, welcome back, and uh, let's begin lecture. This is our last lecture of January. Uh, exam one on Monday, uh, I just have a few comments about it. Uh, we're, first of all, the scantrons, we're, we're waiting for those uh, to be graded. Uh, scantrons are hard to predict. Sometimes you get them back the very same day. Sometimes you got to wait two days and stuff, so... Uh, hopefully by, let's see, today's Wednesday, right? Hopefully by Friday, hopefully tonight sometime, we'll get the Scantron grades back. Uh, and the way that I'm going to do that is basically to set a new row in the uh, grade, in your grades page in web courses. It'll say exam one Scantron, and it'll be worth 24 points because that's how many Scantron items uh, we had. Uh, okay, written problems. Uh, the two written problems. Uh, on the uh, drone velocity, uh, it was feast or famine, just about. There were a lot of students that nailed it. And there were some, there was a handful of students that, uh, you know, were pretty far off. Uh, and in fact, there, you know, I gr I've graded some of them myself. The grader is going to be grading most of them, but I like to grade a few just so I can, you know, get a flavor of, uh, you know, what you guys are producing. And there were a few that were zero out of eight. So, uh, so hopefully you got some points on the Scantron or the velocity graph. Uh, velocity graph, uh, there's a normal. It wasn't feast or famine. It was just a, you know, normal range of, uh, of, uh, expertise on that. So, uh, you'll see, um, well, we'll talk about both of those in just a minute. Also, I have talking PDFs for each of those, and I'll be putting those into, uh, the web courses talking PDF page, uh, a little bit later tonight when I get home. All right. Um, uh, hopefully by next week, Everything will be finished grading, um, and you'll have a grade for exam one, all right? Uh, questions from the floor? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, let's take a close look at the written problems. You can make some notes if you like. Uh, and this will this will look a little different than the talking PDF where I, I draw everything out. This one just kind of a little animation. All right, here's the drone velocity, 11.5 uh, meters per second. It's supposed to be straight east. Few. A few of you need to really understand, to really think about what northeast, south, and west mean. Uh, and, and, and as I've said in, in the past, you want to read carefully. Some of you, I don't know what you were doing, um, but the directions and stuff of these vectors were all spelled out very clearly in the, the problem itself. Um, and, uh, so here's the wind velocity, except and so that's uh, in the right proportion, except it was tilted. So these are the two vectors that you have to add together. Now we were doing displacements and fields and all that stuff. It works the same way with velocities or any other force or any other vector system. Uh, here's uh, kind of a sub triangle for the wind velocity. It was tilted 45 degrees southeast. So you had to do, uh, I don't know if it's still up here, cosine of seven, uh, cosine of 45 degrees uh, for the vertical and horizontal components of that. Uh, here's the resultant, and um, here's the uh, triangle uh, for the resultant. And uh, you can get everything off of that triangle if you construct it. Um, using this pink uh, sub-triangle here, all right? 
because that's the added dimension uh, for this big uh, this big uh, hatched triangle. Okay, questions? Yes. The what? The y component of the drone speed is zero. It's just straight east. So you don't have to do any component componenting up with that one. Just the wind. If you did it analytically. Well, this is this triangle here. You don't have to calculate an area of this. It's just to illustrate. I mean, you can do. You know, you don't. You, I was looking for a diagram uh, like like this, but you didn't have to draw this triangle in. But if if you had these three sides, you're good. So, another question. Yes, Rachel. The question was um, how. How fast is the resultant speed, the length of the blue arrow? What tilt angle is it? And can you draw the diagram? Can you do it uh, graphically? So I was looking for this diagram, and then I was looking for a little bit of Pythagorean theorem and a little bit of inverse tangent or, you know, however you want to do the trig. All right. So I, I calculated this angle up here. I think it was like 13.2 or something like that. All right. I think it was 13.2 degrees negative, this angle right here. And then this was – now, um, the other thing I'm, I'll, I'll uh, just impart and share with you is um, there's going to be – I didn't specify how to round off. And I normally do that on uh, numerical calculations. I forgot to do it for this one. So there's going to be a little bit of slop. Some of you are going to have 15.4, I think, for the speed. Uh, some of you 15.5. So the grader will know how to, you know, he'll he'll give you uh, dineros on that, you know, because it, it's a, you know, like, I, and I did it two different times, you know, once for the grader and once for myself. And I got, you know, 15.4 and 15.5 on the, the, the overall speed, so uh, it just depends on how you round it off. Question? Will we ever use significant figures? Yeah, we will be using significant figures, and um, I just forgot to do it this time, you know. So, but I, actually, I think some of the multiple choice questions did have significant figures. Another question. No, you didn't have to. Uh, I did, but if you write 13.2 degrees south of east, it's good. If it's right on your diagram, it's good. You know, you know we're, you know, it's not the the only time that I, I, Rachel, that I do something like that is if I'm using clickers to click in the answer, because clicking you have to specify the answer ahead of time, and so you have to tell students. Uh, okay, to the nearest tenth of a degree, and use negative if it's you know. But uh, but if we're if we're just grading written problems, you know, since we're humans, uh, you know we can, you know, we can say yeah, okay, that's good. Even if it's not, doesn't look exactly like mine. Another question before we go to problem, the the second problem. Uh, yeah. You're going to get the exams. I have not decided. I think you're going to have to get the written problems back, and that's why you have names on both sides. So we can tear those off and give them back to you. But see, in this class, handing you back papers is a nightmare. And, I, you know, because we have to go through the labs, and the labs are not always. By the way, I'm going to also impart something to you. And I want you to all listen very carefully. I don't want you to think anything that you go over in labs is ever going to be on my exam. 
It's not. I have no input on what's going in uh, in the labs. And I understand they're doing stuff over there that who knows, you know, what's going on over there with, with your, uh, what, your first 60 minutes? You're not even doing labs. You're doing problems or something. Um, so, I, you know, and I have no... I have no idea what they're doing over there. All right. And so do not. If if you see something on an exam that reminds you of something from lab it from, from the, the, you know, the, the problem solving part of lab, it's purely accidental. All right. My lectures, my homework my problems that I like, my clicker questions, that is what you're going to see on, and the readings from our textbook, uh, that's what you're going to see on exams, okay? So, all right, so just a word of warning. I had a student ask me about that, and I, I, you know, I don't even know what you guys are doing over there. All that, all that the lab people do is they give me your score out of 100%, you know, so 93% or 75% or whatever your lab grade is. And then I put that in. I, I have no input. And uh, I have, as we say in German, kind of ahnung about what's going on over there in the labs. And there's some, and, and here's another little advisory for your mental sanity. The labs are frequently way out of sync with lectures. You know, so, you know, you guys were doing carts the other day and, you know, you know, we're going to start talking about forces and stuff today, but it's, you know, it's, and I apologize to you that the labs here have to be really, really in this class and in all the other uh, undergraduate physics intro f physics one and two classes, they just have to be redone. It's, it's. Part, part of the reason is we just don't have enough lab space, so we just have to cram stuff in. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, anyways, let's keep going. Get your clickers uh, out. Uh-oh. Let me pause the uh, YouTube for a second. Okay, here's the... We're going to use the clickers in a second. Here's the velocity graph. Um, what I was looking for on this one was uh, correctly labeled axes, uh, temporal axis horizontally, a velocity axis vertically. I was looking for a triangle to start and then a level rectangle to finish. Um, the distances, like for instance, this, you actually didn't need to calculate this one, uh, although I know some of you did. Uh, this was the one over here that you had to kind of back calculate, figure out a T subscript H. And I saw a lot of you guys nail this one. So this one uh, looks pretty good. Uh, so uh, questions about this one. Uh, the answer was uh, 3.909, 3.9. Raise your hand if you remember getting that, 3.9. Good. Yeah, that's about what I... Another question? Yeah. What? Okay, students. Shh. Come on. We got stuff to, to, to you know, don't get too talkative. Um... I, I did this, a student asked me uh, Monday night, Dr. B, she, she was uh, all the, riding the bus back to her apartment. And I don't want, and whoever it is, I'm not going to look at you, but don't raise your hand and say, oh, that was me. Uh, but I, you know, I, you know, she, she said, Dr. B, you know, I think it's actually 2.9 or, so, or 3.9. And uh, so I made up this diagram for that student. And uh, you didn't, but you actually didn't have to calculate this triangle for this, you know, this time. You know, some other time you may have to do it. So, 
All right, let's talk about Newton's three laws of motion. And right, now we're in chapter Quatros. And there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the master, the, as, as they say in Kung Fu movies, the student of Galileo has become the master. Um, the three laws of, of motion that uh, Sir Isaac Newton developed are on these two basic topics. Uh, considering all the forces that are acting on an object, what happens? And then the second one, or the second type of uh, law uh, was really a speculate, or not a speculation, but a, um, a, uh, a law about how he viewed uh, physical interactions. So the first set, the t first two laws come out of this. Do the forces balance? Of all the f forces acting on, on you, you know, like right now you're sitting on your chair in, the, in your row, and you're, you know what is on the seat. The seat is pushing upward, and gravity's pushing downward. And you may be propping yourself up a little bit to the side with your elbow. Um, and those are the forces acting on you, all right? If you're in a, you know, the skateboard's up here. You know, they had a little bit of friction. You know, the friction, if the, if the skateboarder was moving to the right, the friction would have been a little bit of a frictional force uh, acting to the left to, to slow them down. All right, so, um, and the skateboarder, you know, the forces on the skateboard would be the weight force down and then the, the rigidity force or the normal force upward. Now, if the forces balance, you have the law of inertia. And the law of inertia says if an object, an object will stay at rest or in a, a state of, straight line, constant speed, unless acted upon by an unbalanced force, right? But if everything balances, you either stay at rest or you continue in the same direction that you're going uh, and at the same speedometer rating, all right? Now, if they don't balance, so here's your decision tree. So you got all the, you know, all the forces, you know, like you're out there playing hoops, you know, and you got, you know, you know, you got your double team. So you got LeBron James guarding you from in back and you got who's on the Lakers. Kyle Kuzma uh, on the Lakers guard you from the right. So they're both shoving you. And you got gravity pulling you downward. That's from the earth. And you got the gym floor. All right. And then, you know, so you got a lot of forces. And if they don't balance, you're going to accelerate. You know, you either get kicked to the floor and LeBron James gets a foul or whatever, or you accelerate upward and slam dunk it right over the top of LeBron James, which I'm sure is everybody's fantasy. So now we're going to talk about those in detail. This is kind of the logical structure, all right? So two of his three laws are about, all right, what happens? You know, let's talk about all the forces acting, the pushes, the pulls, the friction, the gravitation, you know, the normal force of rigid surfaces. You know, the wall, if, you, if, you, if we had a skateboarder over here, push on the wall, the wall would push back. And the skateboarder would go the opposite direction. The wall ain't going anywhere because it's, it's, it's rigid. It's effectively infinite mass. It can't be moved. But the skateboarder will go flying off in the other direction. And so that's what these first two. So law of inertia, that's his first law. And you know who developed that? Uh, Galileo. You know, Galileo developed that law. And uh, Sir Isaac Newton said, yeah, let's, let's keep it. And, and we'll use that as our first law. And then... The second law is about accelerations. And then the third law is, come on, baby. It's kind of a status. 
It's kind of a description. It says that if you have two, two skateboarders interacting, or if you have two galaxies interacting, or two electrons in a molecule of rhodopsin interacting and causing that molecule to fold and unfold for your eye to see and not see. Those interactions, whatever else is true, the forces are the same size. Now, this is thinking of every interaction in the universe as being between two objects. So it's kind of idealized. And one object is going to push on the other, and the, and the second object is going to push on the first. Same size forces, but opposite directions. All right, so the moon pulls the earth toward itself. What? Yeah. Mutual, that's the law of, of universal gravitation. The earth pulls on the moon. The, the earth keeps the moon on its orbit. It's like a rope, you know, swinging the, you know, swinging a lariat. You know, the moon's on the lariat. You're just swinging it around. You know, that gravitational force of earth to the moon is just keeping it on. But, you know, the, the, the moon exerts the same number of uh, units of force on the earth. But the earth is so much gi more ginormous, you don't really see the, you know, the earth accelerating. But if you were to look out into the universe, did you know that most stars that we see in our galaxy are in binary star systems? You know, our sun is a single star, a singleton. But most stars in the universe, like the Big Dipper, if you know the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper's got um, bunches of double stars in it, binary stars we call it. And most stars are binary. And so when you look at binary stars, you can see them orbiting the mutual center of mass of the two star systems, which is kind of cool. So this this third law is an, it's it's actually kind of a description or a status of interaction. And then you know to actually predict what's going to happen, you have to use either number one or number two. All right. So here's number one. First law of inertia: every object retains a state of rest or its state of uniform straight line motion unless acted upon. By an unbalanced force. All right. All right. So rest. So uh, uh, Aristotle would have said, yeah, okay, rest. Yeah, that's good. Normal. Um, no unbalanced forces. But Aristotle would never have agreed to the second one, a uniform straight line motion. So that means straight line, same direction, and uniform speed. Aristotle would never have agreed to that. But Galileo said, you know what? I think this is uh, the case. And he has elaborate arguments. And it's actually true. That is uh, one of the laws of nature. So for an example, an, an apple and an apple tree, you have a pair of balanced forces. You know, first of all, you have the stem attached to the branch. And the stem pulls up on the apple. All right. Big deal. And gravitational weight force pulls down on the apple, right? But it's up there on the branch, and it's just, you know, it's up there getting nice and juicy and ripe, um, and it's at rest, okay, for the most part. Now, if the stem weakens, you know, it dries out in the autumn, those things will get a little bit crispy, and the right gust of wind comes down, the apple will fall down out of the tree, the balance fails, and down she comes. Okay, and if you're sitting underneath the apple tree and it falls on your coconut right here, just like for Sir Isaac Newton, you might discover the law of gravitation, universal gravitation. That's what they say happened for uh, Sir Isaac. All right, so that's an example of balanced and, un, you know, the second one is unbalanced forces. All right, now, here's another one. This is something that uh, many of you uh, ride the shuttle buses they're so comfy, and they're always on time. You know, there's no... so so. All right. So if you're on the bus, and let's just say that you're standing out in the aisle, and you you know your feet are on the floor, but you're not holding on to anything. You're just kind of out there, you know, kind of surfing, right? If the 
if the bus accelerates forward, you're going to fall backwards because you're going to try to preserve the state of motion before the acceleration. All right. So um, the bus moves forward, you lurch backwards. All right. Second case, the bus turns right and, you know, you're kind of standing in the aisle and you're going to bump, you know, the bus turns to the right, it accelerates to the right. Um, you're going to bump your left hip because you're going to try to keep going straight. And that's going to take you into the, the seats to your left because they're coming at you from the left. They're turning right with the bus. Everything that's bolted down into the bus um, is, is doing what the bus does. All right, so those seats are going to blaze right into you. So you're going to bump your hip. All right, so, so what you do is you – and, it, you know, this is what you do. You stabilize yourself fore and aft, port and starboard. All right. That's normal. Unless your bus never changes its state of motion. And that is not that is definitely not true for those. I don't know. Sometimes it feels like they're riding on square wheels. I, I you know. They're sta or they either that or they find every possible pothole in the street. And then they you know, like little kids. Did you ever do this when you were a little kid? You know, it's raining out. And you see some big mud puddles, and you go stomp your feet in them. Yeah, I see people nodding their head. It, that's what it seems like the bus drivers do. All right, question. I click your question. Let's see if I can do this. All right, so. Uh, let me start this. As multiple choice. Okay. You observe a can of Pepsi. Go ahead. Got it? Oh boy, you guys are blazing. Yeah, the first one always, yeah. What if what? Coke and Pepsi? I don't know, man. Diet Pepsi Coke? Cheeseburger? Okay, 10 seconds to vote starting right now. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Stop. Uh, yeah, more than one. All right, now go ahead and, you know, die a can of Pepsi on the tabletop. Uh, one of the forces is gravity. All right, you got some downward force from the earth and you've got some rigidity force from the tabletop, all right? You can't do this with a table made of water because the water doesn't provide any rigidity unless it's frozen water, but liquid water, no, all right? So here's your gravity force. Go ahead and make an arrow downward and make the upward arrow the same size. Now, these are not. Th this is not a third law pair. This is just two different arrows. Two different forces acting on an object. This is not a this is not a picture of the third law. The third law is about two different objects and one interaction. All right. So since there's no delta v, it's uh, it's at rest. That means there's no acceleration. No acceleration. No unbalanced external forces. All right. No, this is, these are the forces on the can of Pepsi. The, the, the number of forces on a single can. Now, you might say, well, what's the interaction between the can and the earth? The can and the earth, you'd have the, downward, the white arrow downward, but then you'd have to draw a picture of the earth or a dot to represent the earth 
and an arrow upward to the can. Right? It's just totally different for third law. The rigidity force is the upward arrow. It's the same size. All right, so what if you do have unbalanced forces? How do you hack that? All right, students, here we go. The engineering students around the world have this law on the brain. This is Newton's second law. All right, so you add up all the forces. All right, and if anything does not balance, that's your net force. All right, so F subscript net. And it might be in two dimensions or one dimension. You know, one dimension, you just got to do pluses and minuses. Pluses to mean right, minuses to mean left. You know, pluses to mean upward, minuses to mean downward. But if you're in, in two dimensions or three, you can still do it. Do a little bit of trig. All right. So now, for instance, so here's our example. Dwight Howard versus LeBron James. Okay, so let's say that Dwight Howard pulls the basketball with 100 units of force to the right. So I, I write down plus 100. And let's say that the notorious weenie, uh, LeBron James, can only manage 80 units of force to the left. So he has a minus 80. All right, leftward. So... Uh, the sum, 100 plus, and this is a vector sum, 100 positive plus a negative 80 equals 20. All right, so there's your net force. All right, that's the stuff that, you know, doesn't balance. All right, so, uh, so Dwight Howard wins the battle. And so up above there, you can see the basketball and I've got the LeBron James arrow going to the left and the Dwight, Har the Dwight Howard arrow going to the right. And they're different lengths. And then down below that, in place of those two, I've got the basketball again and one single arrow to represent the net force. All right. So the upper two, the LeBron James and the Dwight Howard forces, those are what you would call constituent forces. They constitute the net force, okay? And you'll hear me use that vocabulary terms. Now, another factor in Sir Isaac Newton's law is this. All right, so you got this net force, right? Now, the more of that you have on a given object, the more acceleration, all right? And so the more kilograms of mass you have, However, the less acceleration. So number two is, okay, if, if you have a shopping cart, you know, a normally loaded shopping cart at, uh, at Publix and Arnold Schwarzenegger comes up and pushes it, you know, he's got a lot of muscle, so it's going to really blaze down the aisle versus a little shrimpy first grader you know, they, they can push it, but it's not going to go blazing down the aisle. So that's depending on the size of the push. The more push you have, like with Arnold, you get more acceleration. Now, same. Now number three is, okay, take two different shopping carts, okay, and load up one of them, you know, right to the, to the rim, right to the top with, with cereal. So get your, your – um, you know, your Captain Crunch, your, what's another cereal? Lucky Charms, Rice, Rice Krispies, really light. Okay, so just load it up with that kind of stuff, right? And then load up the other one with, like, canned beets and canned peas and all kinds of canned stuff, really heavy, right? A lot of kilograms, okay? So the one, and so get Arnold to push both of them. And the one with cereal will have more acceleration. The one with more with the peas and the canned stuff, more kilograms of mass, less acceleration, right? And also, same thing with a little shrimpy first grader. A little shrimpy first grader will be able to push the cereal, uh, you know, it's a little bit less. And the canned goods, he might just barely be able to budge. You know, so now, this is 
the equation that encodes this concept of pushing against inertia, against mass. The acceleration is equal to the the fraction. I keep getting these. You know what they do? This three, these three two one numbers. Something about my college loans, which I paid off. I had like eighteen hundred dollars in grad school for my college loan. And I paid it off decades ago. So it's kind of like it's kind of like those those uh, crank call, those guys that call from. You know, they call say, "Well, uh, our records show that." You have to have a Windows security patch on your computer. And we don't have any Windows computers in our house. So I did that one time. Did I tell you what I did? I, I said, yeah, okay. That sounds good. Let me give you my social security number. And here's my bank account. So I, but instead of my social security number, I started giving them the digits of pi. <laughs> <laughs> and so... He said he got really mad, and he said, you're wasting my time. Bam. Whoa. He hung up. He hung up the phone. It was pretty good. So that's my secret. <coughs> Just give him digits of pi. Anyways, A equals F net over M, uh, or the preferred way uh, that they do it in the, uh, uh, the engineering department, F equals MA. So if you have any friends that are engineering majors, is anybody in here an engineering major? One? If you have a friend that's an engineering major and you really want to tick them off, all you're going to do is find them while they're, while them and their, you know, the guys with the really thick glasses and stuff, and they're working on some really intense homework, and just, you know, lean over them, you know, and just, just stroll by, just casual like, oh, yeah, okay, F equals MA. And you'll never be wrong. And they'll, but they'll be befuddled. They'll say, "How the hell did he see that?" In all these, you know, equations and stuff. But it's, it's always the same. It's always true. F equals m a. It rules the world. So, now here's a picture, Figure One from Chapter Four Point Three. And this introduces something that we're going to use at the Wazoo, the free body diagram. The free body diagram is over here, on the right. So what you do is, you know. You, you you have this this object. So the object that you're trying to study is this little shrimpy kid in the wagon, right? And the little shrimpy kid in the wagon is getting a push from this big uh, girl, and then it's getting a push. Uh, the wagon is getting a push from this uh, other girl, uh, and so that's F1 and F2. And then it's got some downward weight force, and it's got some upward capital N. That's for normal force, which you can read about in the textbook. Uh, it's normal or perpendicular to the surface always. Uh, and then over here, this little left uh, directed arrow with lowercase f, that stands for friction. All right, so those are all the forces acting on that. So what you do is, you know, so here they are. They're kind of like this. And what, you know, the way, the way that you would do it, you know, if you're trying to figure out the net, you would put a dot over here to represent the center of mass of this little kid in the wagon, right? And then just draw the arrows with the tail on that dot. And in the case of two arrows in the same direction, F1 and F2, just put them, you know, uh, consecutively like this. And then here's the upward normal force, capital N. That's the rigidity force. Okay. And then this is the downward weight force, you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay. And, uh, and you know, you're going to be doing some homework tonight, due on Friday uh, from this chapter. So question. Yeah, normal force and rigidity force are the same. Rachel, did you have a question? This one over here? This one. F equals M A. Yeah, that's just the next an a, another version of A equals F over M. Newton's second law. Newton's second law.
It's for everybody. But it's it's like imprint it's seriously imprinted in the the brain of every engineering student. It's pretty bodacious. So there's your free body. So make a note of that. The free body diagram. It's it's pretty important skill. This is a fairly simple one. And what do we got? Uh, five forces acting. And here's another one, a little bit simpler. Uh, same little shrimpy kid in the wagon, but now he's just got his MOM giving him a push. So she's got a little bit bigger force over here. So she's gonna. Ha so this baby's gonna have a little bit of um, a little bit more <coughs> acceleration. So what you're gonna do, it, you know, when you're when you're working on a problem. Your, your objective is, is frequently to draw some kind of a free body diagram, either from a, 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 an illustration like this or from a bunch of sentences in a paragraph. Now, your homework tonight is going to be – so here's the free body diagram down here. Your homework tonight um, is going to involve um, – I think it's a motorcycle. Uh, and I haven't fixed it up exactly the way I want it, but – now, let's get back to Newton's second law. But you're going to be doing a free body diagram stuff for homework, among other things. All right, so over on the right, you can see uh, over here, A equals delta V over delta T. So that's just the definition of acceleration. Now, Newton's second law, F equals MA, good. So how about if we just do this? Put in delta V over delta T where A was. No, no harm in that. But now if you look, so that's down here in the lower right corner, that's a perfectly fine version of Newton's second law. But this last version is instructive because, um, you know, you think about the measurements that you need to make that. You know, you need time and distance measurements to get your velocities, your elapsed time. And then you need some mass measurements in kilograms, and you can get the right-hand side of that. Another thing I want to bring up is, you know, so you, you make calculations of velocities and acceleration. The stopping time that you, ex, excuse me, the stopping time delta T, you know, if you jump from a table onto the floor, you come to a stop on the floor by the floor exerting an upward force on you, okay? It's a rigid floor, all right? The amount of time it takes you to stop is in the denominator, all right? The more stopping time you have, the bigger the denominator and the smaller the force. So look at it there. Delta T, that's your stopping time. Delta V is, you know, whatever your your impact velocity is when you hit the floor. You know, you jump and you got, you know, like two meters per second when you hit the floor and you flex your knees and you stop. But if you have less stopping time, that's in the denominator. Delta T is in the – so if you have a smaller denominator, uh-oh, you got a big stopping force. All right? Now, an example of this is two different stopping modes. If you're in a car, you stop really slowly, big stopping time, if you're stopping in a big snow drift, like they have up in Fargo, North Dakota right now, with all that snow and cold weather. So you come to a stop in a snow drift, it takes, you know, like a second or two. So the stopping force is not that bodacious. But if you... Um, go a thousand miles to the south, you know, down into uh, Arkansas, and you run your car, the same car, into a brick wall at the same speed. Stopping time is very small. Stopping, and so the denominator is very small. The quotient is ginormous. The force of stopping is ginormous. You smash up your car. Snow drift doesn't smash up your car. Here's another example. You know, you're doing some plyometrics. 
And when you, you know, if you, if you ever do plyometric workouts and you, you don't flex your knees, you're going to be really sore. And why is that? Because you come to a sudden stop. That puts a lot of force on your knees. All right, so you flex your knees, uh, and it's a little bit easier. All right, next question um, is uh, about a liter bottle of water. One point zero 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 kilograms, thousand grams. You put a pull force that gives it one meter per second squared of acceleration. What's the size of your net pull force? Remember, F equals M A. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, you guys did good. Hold on a second. I see we're out of time. Uh, let me uh, just get to the. Oh, the answer is, uh, uh-oh, what happened? Oh, by the uh, students, don't leave yet. Make a note, this is the definition of the metric unit of force, the Newton. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a pep talk just for a second. Uh, on, uh, oh, here we go, uh, on the homework. All right, we have a few more to do, but. All right, now, I'm going to give you something like number 10 in Chapter 4 or 3, but it's not going to be exactly verbatim number 10, but it's going to be like that, something about a powerful motorcycle. All right, I'll get that up tonight, and you'll have until Friday to do it. Okay, now you're dismissed.